in his uh, speaking time. Uh, it, it's part of the Access for All scheme, which is sponsored by Network Rail to in, install lifts, which obviously over, are, are needed there at the station, separate pot of money, separate scheme. And there is, as part of that scheme, to investigate ways to improve the footpaths around the station. So Access for All as part of that agenda. Uh, and I understand at that time, back in, it was back in late 2020, uh, Cheshire East Council working with Network Rail, so separate from planning and separate from the regulation position that I take, uh, were not at that time proposing sing singling outside the station to provide footways. There are potentially other ways that could be used to provide additional footways, potentially acquiring land to increase footway widths. I mean, that, that was a separate project which I'm not directly involved in myself. It's part of the access for all. So <coughs> I think Councillor Burke will mention in Councillor Tony Dean there. Uh, no, I don't believe at this moment in time, Cheshire East Council as the access for all are promoting the signalised signalisation and singling outside the station. They are looking at other ways of doing it. But I'm looking at it from an applicant, an applicant as proposed to do it. So I may comment on the proposal as it is in front of us. And my view is yes, we could achieve the benefits of wider footways by introducing the singling with the signals and that has been modelled and from a regulatory perspective I'm content that the introduction of the singling and signalisation will, 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 will achieve the Im improvements at the station particularly in relation to promoting active travel so just hope, hope that clarifies things there. Thank you uh, Mr Hurdis I, I believe it does. Uh, Councillor Findlay please. Councillor Findlow. I was only going to say, Chairman, that uh, that's a clear explanation. Thank you. Uh, I think it would be preferable to see a fuller report on the consequences and the case for and against, given local opposition and local views on signalling and signalling. And that could easily be done at the next stage of this process. That's all. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Findlow. Uh, well, it has been proposed uh, by Councillor Manning, seconded by Councillor Harewood for approval uh, with the addition of appropriately worded conditions in relation to cycle parking and disability access with a further request that a future reserve matters application comes back before this committee uh, for consideration. Um, with that in mind, are there any final comments or advice that uh, Mr Crowther wishes to add? Uh, I'll go to Mrs Baxter first. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Can I just check that we're also um, removing Condition 11? Just bear with me a second. Yeah, I know, I know um, uh, Mr Crowther suggested that. I just wanted to confirm, is that staying or...? or condition going? 11 is, uh, prior to the commencement of operation of the park and ride facility, the Hammondforth Railway Bridge Signal Scheme detailed YW, sorry, WYG drawing number 001 shall be implemented and be operational. Are the proposer and seconder happy for that condition to be removed? Councillor Mannion. This is what I was suggesting. Yeah, the, the if if the members are not happy with the existing wording of condition eleven, why don't we just uh, prior to the commencement of operation uh, an appropriate term traffic management scheme for Hanforth Railway Bridge be implemented? Full stop. Let's not be prescriptive, but there needs to be something in place before we start. And as I say, rather than being prescriptive of what the diagram currently says. Let's just Great. put them down a requirement. How is, that, how is that not appropriate? Sounds sensible to me. Can I just check with the seconder that that's acceptable? Councillor, Councillor Harewood. That's acceptable, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you for following that up, Chairman. I'm grateful. My pleasure. Uh, Mr Crowther, please. Thank you, Chair. Can I, can I just be clear what members are looking for here? Because obviously at the moment um, the scheme proposes um, singling the carriageway. Clearly that's something you asked us to look at again. Um, but obviously we don't know what that other scheme could consist of at this stage and whether it has any realistic possibility of, of working. In other words, this, this is the design that's been sort of proposed on the basis of, of providing good pedestrian access to either side of the railway bridge. And frankly, to provide a good footpath 
on either side isn't going to need to um, narrow the carriageway. And we've already heard from Mr. Herders that the only way of achieving that satisfactorily is putting signals in, in from a safety point of view and an operational point of view. So w clearly, if you're not happy with the signaling of the carriageway, that's fine. Um, but I'm. I'm not quite sure that what the condition would achieve in terms of a, of a new scheme. I mean, I think what some of the things I think as Paul Hurd has, has already alluded to, you know, there, there may be other op options in terms of acquiring land, but they are notoriously difficult and time consuming operations. And the likelihood of success is clearly a complete unknown at this stage. So we could result, we could have a result that we cannot do anything with that railway bridge. That's something you do need to bear in mind. So it may have to stay as it is. So just just be be careful with this one, members, in terms of the the, the realities in the future. Thank you uh, for that, Mr. Crowther. I think what I'm hearing, if I can attempt to summarise on behalf of the other members, um, is uh, a desire to see the footpath width extended. Um, but uh, not absolute uh, agreement with the currently proposed uh, traffic management uh, I, uh, scheme uh, that's being uh, that's being suggested. So attempting to leave by removing that condition a degree to leave a degree of flexibility when the full application comes forwards and comes back before this committee. Now it may be, as you just said, that that has to be traffic signals, uh, but in the meantime, it may be possible for <coughs> officers and for the applicant to consider whether there are other options that are viable. Uh, and if they're not viable, they're not viable, but that will come forward as a future report with the application. OK, so what we're saying is we are not approving the signals at this stage. That is certainly what I'm picking up. Um, and that we'd, we, you're effectively, as a committee, asking us as a, as a council, clearly, to look at this again and see what other options there are. It's sort of, it, it's kind of, it's, it's like you're asking for the reserve matters to be um, reported back to before your good selves. Um, so it's in the same sort of vein as that. Then and it's just yeah. that it, wording a condition would be slightly difficult to say effectively. Look at this again if you see what I'm, where I'm going with this. Uh, it might be that we leave the condition out, but uh, to make sure that I have not misrepresented the proposer and seconder, I'll go back to Councillor Mannion. Yeah, I think it's the fact that we're not um, we're not yet settled on um, uh, wholeheartedly on the on that on that specific proposal. And I think you're right. It, it, all we're asking you to do is, is to go back and look again. And if you come back and and say this is the only viable option well that's uh, when it comes back to the full the full application then therefore that can be set out and i appreciate what you're saying regarding land acquisition because i've got a similar highway project in in my ward at broken cross where that's a major time constraint but what we're saying is uh, it's quite clear to get this through today that not every member of the committee is wholeheartedly sold on on on, on what's proposed what we're saying is this is the initial proposal. Uh, were the conditions so we'd ask you to review it. And if you review it and say, regrettably, this is the only viable proposal, well, that'll be a matter we can consider when the full application comes back. Am I making myself clear? You are, Councillor Mannion, yeah. Right, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Mannion, Mr Crowther. So are, are we all clear on what it is we are being asked to vote on the approval of? with? Uh, two conditions added, uh, one removed, and the requirement to come back before this committee with the reserve matters application. Is, is everybody comfortable? I'm, I'm particularly looking at our officers here and uh, our legal officer in particular. Chair, if I, if I may, my understanding to try and keep this simple is we are not approving the signalling over the over the. So we make, we need to make that clear. Yep. in the decision so we would have to put a condition on effectively that says we are not approving the, the singling over the uh, the carriageway something obviously we need to come back and revisit and we'd have to remove condition forgive me is it condition 11 condition 11 so that requires that to be implemented so that would have to form part of the decision thank you yeah, yeah. okay 
Right, are we okay to go to the vote then? Uh, I can see somebody's made a comment in the chat. Uh, Councillor Smatham and Councillor Nicholas, please. I'm, I'm not desperately against removing this condition. However, I do think we, with given um, the reference to active travel and the recent uh, decisions that we've made as a council to promote active travel uh, in, in our borough, I think that we must ensure that the walker, the pedestrian, the cyclist, the disabled has a good amount of access and we don't prioritise the car in this situation. Quite agreed. Thank you, Councillor Smith. And Councillor Nicholas, please. Thanks, Chair. I mean, obviously, I can see it's a very important part of, the, of this whole whole uh, uh, application. But would it be an idea to defer this until the next uh, council meeting to give time to actually see if we can allay um, uh, Hanforth Parish Council uh, and their concerns and those of the friends of the railway station uh, to see if we can, because if, obviously if we can allay, allay their um, concerns, then obviously uh, that would be really helpful to everybody, wouldn't it? Uh, well, it has been proposed and seconded for approval. Um, I will take that as a proposal for deferral. Uh, is there a second to the proposal of deferral, first of all? No, so I'll take I'll take the vote. Sorry, Councillor McFarlane. Yes, Chair, I, I'll second that. Right, so just give me a second to make a note of this. So it's been proposed by Councillor Nicholas and seconded by Councillor McFarlane. That will now have to be taken first um, in order of presence. We just need to be clear on the reason for the deferral. Um, and I think that is to um, to hear back, uh, well, to, get, to give officers and the applicants uh, basically time to give consideration to the viability of other options to deliver the singling um, of the carriageway uh, yeah. across Station Road. Yeah. I think every I think everybody's every, uh, happy with everything else. So I think it's just that's that's it basically. Yes. Right. Thank you, Councillor Manning. Please. So if we were to vote in favour of deferral, when it comes back, the um, um, the Shingit, the the road issue, the um, Hanforth Hanforth railway station road is the only issue that will be on the agenda. We're not going to. We won't be rerunning the whole app, the whole outline application again. It's a comeback for us to debate that one issue. Is that correct? Uh, you're sort of correct and sort of not correct, Councillor Manny. And the whole application, as it stands before us currently in outline, will come back before us. But we should restrict our debate and our questions to the matter on which we're seeking further clarity today. Is that clear? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. OK, uh, so it's been proposed by Councillor Nicholas, seconded by Councillor McFarlane for deferral. Um, for that reason, I'll now take the vote by roll call. Please indicate uh, whether you're for, against or not voting um, on the proposal of deferral. Councillor Braithwaite, please. For. Councillor Dean. Uh, against. Councillor Findlow. For. Councillor Howard. Against. Councillor Holland. Yeah, against deferral. Councillor McFarlane. For. Councillor Mannion. Against. Councillor Nicholas. For. Councillor Puddicombe. Against. Councillor Smetham. Against. Thank you. And myself, Councillor Craig Brown, against deferral. So I think that is lost. Four votes in favour and seven votes against. So we'll now return to um, the original proposal for approval uh, with those additional conditions and condition 11 uh, removed, uh, but with a clear steer that 
we would like the traffic management proposal to be uh, to be reconsidered. So that was second, sorry, proposed by Councillor Manny and seconded by Councillor Harewood. Um, and again, I'll take the vote um, on that uh, proposal for approval, please. Councillor Braithwaite. Four. Councillor Dean. Four. Councillor Findlow. Four. Councillor Harewood. Councillor Harewood. Four. Four. Thank you. Councillor Holland. Four, Chair. Councillor McFarlane. Four. Councillor Mannion. Four. Councillor Nicholas. Four. Councillor Puddicombe. Four. Councillor Smetham. Four. And myself, Councillor Brown, also four. So I believe that is unanimous um, in its approval. Thank you very much, members. It's now uh, almost 20 minutes past one. Uh, so I propose that we now take our lunch break and uh, reconvene at 2 p.m. Hope that's okay with everybody. I will see you all at 2 p.m. Uh, very good.
Okay, good afternoon again, members, and uh, welcome back. I uh, just need to uh, unfortunately do the roll call um, again to make sure we've got everybody. So, uh, just very briefly, Councillor Braithwaite. Yeah, here, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Dean. Yes, uh, here, Chair, sorry. Thanks, Councillor Finlow. Present. Councillor Howard. Yes, here. Yeah. Councillor Holland. Yes, I'm present, Chair. Councillor McFarlane. Here, Chair. Councillor Mannion. Good afternoon, Chair, and everybody. Thank you. Can I just check if we've got Councillor Murphy? No, Chairman. Um, I'm guessing he's not in yet. OK. Councillor Nicholas. Sorry, yeah, I am here. Yeah. Thanks. Councillor Puddicombe. Yes, Chair. Thanks. Oh, Councillor Smitham. Yes, present. Thanks very much. Uh, so we'll now move on to uh, the next application, which is item eight, uh, application number 20-3347M. This is the installation of a five metre high lattice stub tower supporting three number antennas, uh, two number 300 mil transmission dishes and proposed two number equipment cabinets and ancillary development including 18 number remote radio units and nine number combiners. And this is at Goodall Street, Macclesfield, on behalf of Vodafone, the applicant. So can I now invite our planning officer, Paul Wakefield, to present this application? Thank you, Chairman. I'll just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully we can see that now. It's so this is Goodall Street, um, which runs north to south. Uh, Brook Street is located to the north in Macclesfield, and Jodrell Street to the south, and, and Goodall Street connects the two. Our site is is located just here on the on the right hand side of the picture, um, edged in red. It's part of a site that has or received permission for redevelopment in uh, I think it was 2017 or 2018 part of which has been implemented and constructed um, but the rest remains uh, open and, and undeveloped at the moment and I think is actually subject in fact the area to the to the south of the application site and the area to the rear is the subject of a, a current planning application that is with the council for like, primarily for residential development the existing um, or the new building that's been constructed on the application site is an office building and then adjacent to that there is permission for uh, a couple of residential units and also some assisted living units as well um, we've got residential development um, on jodrell street to the south here there's some on swettenham street to the uh, east there and then again brook street to the north of the site as well but then the remainder primarily to the west, um, towards Macclesfield Town Centre, is, is commercial, um, as was the historical use of the site as well. So just to show uh, the aerial photograph of that, you can probably make out the, the sort of commercial premises that exist to the west of the site, to the left-hand side of the image, uh, in a bit more detail there. And you can see the residential properties to the south, the north, and then along Swetland Street to the east as well. So this, just, just so members are aware, as I say, it's, it's a development that's been part implemented um, and the section that has been implemented and which relates to the current application is this, uh, the section in the middle where we've got these two gable features. Um, it's this bit that's been constructed as will become evident from the photographs that are to follow, but that's just to show the context that, um, that the current building that sits on the application site sits alongside or, or could potentially sit alongside should the development be completed in accordance with these plans that were approved. So this um, is the application site. The proposed uh, lattice tower is located, will be located to the rear of this structure um, on a flat roof section um, at the back, adjacent to that lower rise commercial building at the back as well. 
the next photograph probably shows it a bit clearer. So this is a later photograph and you can just see the flat roof section. So the mast itself would be positioned um, not on the edge, it's, it's centrally positioned to minimise its, its viewpoints, but it, it would be broadly in this location, in the, aligned with the valley of the, of the, two, uh, the two roofs there. But it, sorry, just bear with me. Mouse to go. Just at the back here. So then again, just to put it in, in context, um, these photographs just show um, what surround well is opposite the application site so we say so um, from from the south to the north so we're looking along Goodall Street so if you look at the top left looking south you'd be looking towards Jodrell Street and so you can see these commercial buildings here and then moving along um, there is uh, further commercial buildings and similarly as you go around in a clockwise direction until you get to the bottom left and you're looking back towards Brook Street uh, to the north, you can see on the opposite sides of the road, it, it, it is predominantly commercial, uh, which is reflective of the mixed use nature of the area uh, with this combination of commercial and residential uses quite prominent. So these are the uh, nearest properties on, um, on Brook Street, which back <coughs> the backs of which face towards the application site. Uh, the application site is just this well, we've got the Harris fencing on the corner here. That's the corner of the application site. And then again, just looking around, this is a this bit of wall here is the remnants of um, the previous building that existed on the site. And I think that white, you might just be able to make out. I get my sorry, my mouse isn't working very well. Sorry. There we go. Right. So this white feature here, I think, is the um, the existing telecommunications equipment that has has, has been on the building for some time, um, and the redevelopment of the building is what has dictated the need for this new application to um, to relocate the the telecoms equipment onto the roof of the new building. Then looking um, the other way towards the property is on uh, Jodrell Street, which is to the south. As we see, this is the undeveloped section of the of, of the site uh, where that where permission has been granted for those assisted living units, which would be of similar height to those uh, to the building that's already been constructed and where the uh, mast will be located. So the proposed site plan. Again, this, so this is the building that's being constructed here. Um, these two pitched roofs, and then we've got a flat roof section upon which the mast, um, so the, the tower would be located. It's five metres in height um, from, the, from the flat roof section, which is a total height of 14 metres. I think the, um, the previously approved, oh, the, pre, yeah, the, the most recent approval for equipment on the old building uh, so the former telecommunications equipment um, had a maximum height of 12 metres, so this is two metres higher. Um, but you can see it's it's located um, at the back, uh, as, as 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 far away from sort of public vantage points as it could get, really. And then again, just showing it in a bit more detail. And then, so this is the west elevation that we're, so that's fronting on to Goodall Street. Um, of course, this is a kind of worst case scenario that um, looking at it in elevation view, obviously views from the ground would be would be less or angled, which would minimize, which would reduce views. Then from the, the north elevation, again, you can just see the flat roof section at the back. This, is, this being the pitched roof here <coughs> and then again from the south so um, that's it for the presentation chairman but for the reasons set out in the report it is recommended for approval thank you very much thanks very much mr wakefield i'll now move on to public speaking time we've got uh, two 
uh, registered public speakers and the first of those is Councillor Warren, the ward councillor. So I'd now like to invite you to address the committee. Councillor Warren, you have five minutes and maybe questions afterwards. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. Um, I'm speaking today on behalf of re residents who have objected to this proposal and approached me to speak on their behalf. Obviously, we understand the need for this mast and the advantages and benefits it will provide for the wider population. But quite simply, for the mast this size, the location is wrong. The two main issues residents and I have are the location of the mast and its size compared to the narrow monopole it will replace. The location is very close to current homes on Brook Street, where residents will have a change in their view and see the size and mass of this new mast from their gardens and rear windows. But also, I, and I don't know if anybody picked up on this, on the west elevation that um, you've just been shown by the planning officer, um, the Macclesfield Activity Centre has is subject to a planning application for 26 units, 14 houses and 12 flats and apartments. Um, and the boundary is literally within touching distance of the back of those um, buildings where the, the mast is going to be sited. So it will be a significant visual impact for those new home, homes as and when um, they get approved. And policy DC60 from the Save Macclesfield Borough Local Plan states this type of proposal would normally be approved except for when one of the four listed reasons occur. And one of those reasons is that is if it is visually obtrusive and results in a significant impact on visual amenity. I would argue that because this is not a light for light replacement and the fact that the old narrow monopole antenna is proposed to be replaced by a much wider, larger lattice tower with dishes and antenna attached, plus the fact, as the plan officer said, this tower will be two metres taller, taking it to a total height of 15 metres or approximately 45 feet in old money, will result in this proposal being considered more than obtrusive and dominating for those residents who currently live by and those who might live by should the uh, previously mentioned planning application be approved. I would also ask you to consider whether you feel the applicant has evidence sufficiently that they have explored the possibility of using an existing building such as the much taller mill across the road on Goodall Street, which is required by the MPPF. Was, was the mass to be mounted on the uh, mill, it would take the visual impact further away from the dwelling houses and also from the Macclesfield Canal Conservation Area on Swetnam Street. So in, in summary, although this sounds like a bit of nimbyism, it actually is because it's an inappropriate size and mass of the mass which is going to impact on current and new residents as and when the new houses are built. So I'm not asking you to um, say, you know, we don't want a mask. Yeah, we're quite happy having a mask because we know the benefits, but it needs to be an appropriate mask. And I think for one this size and of this mass, there is a there are better locations in the vicinity which would uh, suit the developers' needs. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Any questions from members? So I've got Councillor Mannion, please. Uh, thanks, Councillor Warren. As, as well as the location, uh, the, the, as you say, the, you, you'd suggest there's more appropriate locations in the neighbourhood. Are there more appropriate designs that might be less visually intrusive that could be considered? Um, that's a bit of a technical question, really. I think because of the uh, the technology that's involved now in telecommunications, I think the old monopoles aren't sufficient. Obviously, that's why they're replacing it with this one. And again, I have no issues with uh, with the, the the size and the mass. It just in that location, it will dominate houses and the, the views of, of residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dean, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Councillor Warren. Just for clarification, uh, you mentioned there is an alternative site, a mill, I think you said, close by. Um, uh, are you talking about <clears throat> a proposal to uh, preferred by the residents would be to have the mast on the roof of said mill or inside said mill on the top story, say? Um, 
Thanks for the question, Councillor Dean. I think what I'm trying to say is that you have to be satisfied as a planning committee that the applicant has evidence sufficiently they've explored that possibility. That's set out in the MPPF and it's in the officer's report. So I would, I would ask you to question the applicant for that evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's probably a good question to ask the next speaker. Uh, Councillor McFarlane, please. <clears throat> Oh, good afternoon, Councillor Warren. Um, just a question, please. I'm just wondering if um, it looks like uh, it's uh, it's a um, it's a metallic structure. The the first three metres or so of the proposed tower, it's a scaffolding type structure. If that was boxed in in a way, would that help the local opinion? Do you think to get to love it a bit better, or what do you think? Is it just the height of it? Is it just the sheer height? Could it be boxed in in any way, do you think? Um, again, a bit of a technical question, I think. Um, I know radio waves have to have line of sight for them to be effective, and whether you can mask it in under under another structure, was, uh, I wouldn't have thought it was possible. I don't think you'll get residents to love it. I think it's, um, it's a question of whether is this design and location suitable and appropriate for what is fast becoming a, a residential area. Yeah, thank you. OK, I think that's all the questions, Councillor Warren. So uh, thank you. If I could ask you now to turn off your camera and microphone and we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, could I now invite, uh, thank you, could I now invite uh, Jenny Han, who is the agent for the applicant. Uh, please could you turn on your camera and microphone and uh, you have three minutes uh, speaking time. Please begin whenever you're ready. Members and Chair, this is an existing well-established rooftop telecommunications site. When the application was submitted in July last year, its purpose was to relocate the existing radio base station to the rooftop of the new office building element of the approved mixed-use scheme, thus facilitating the approved redevelopment of this site. During the lifetime of the current application, the site provider removed antennas from the park-demolished former industrial unit that they were located on and demolished the rest of the structure in October last year. This action caused the site to go off air and it has been down ever since. As a result, there is currently no service to the surrounding area for Vodafone. Neighbouring cells have had to work a lot harder in order to provide any form of service to the immediate area for this operator. Customers are experiencing much poorer service as calls are dropped and constant buffering is an issue. This replacement site is urgently required in order to restore existing 2G, 3G and 4G service provision and provide the latest 4G technologies to the immediate area and prevent other neighbouring cell sites from also suffering from drop calls and constant buffering. We all need high quality communications. In the modern world, a huge amount of time is spent using our handheld devices for work, to stay in touch with our friends and family and in order to go about our daily lives as important as gas and electricity. We've all come to realise how important such devices are during the COVID era, era we are all living through. For some, a lifeline to the outside world. Without maintaining the existing network and upgrading it, providing the latest technologies, users would not be able to rely on a high quality communications network when they need it most. The loss of existing services is a significant step backwards in the drive for digital connectivity and contrary to government aspirations and the local strategy. This is the most suitable location. It is a well-established telecommunications site and will be located on an existing building. This fully complies with MPPF and the local plan. Other commercial industrial units nearby are not designed to support telecommunications equipment. The rest of the area is residential and the streets are too narrow to accommodate a radio base station. The height cannot be reduced as this will cause clipping of the roof. The design has been reduced significantly in width since the application was originally submitted. This minimises the impact on the surrounding area. Also, the design is also necessary to provide replica and the latest technologies in this area. And its thin lattice design also allows light to pass through it. Restoring existing coverage and capacity to enable customers to once more be able to utilise their handheld devices in this area, the well-established telecommunications site, and due to the lack of suitable alternative options, we strongly in favour of the proposed development, and I urge members to support this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, please, members? 
Councillor Harewood. You have said about, I'm sorry, Miss Han. You have spoken about better service. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How, how, how well or how much have you engaged the residents uh, to, uh, in this structure? How well and how, how did you engage them at all so that you come upon some kind of dialogue between yourselves? Have you managed to do that? Before the application was submitted in line with the code of best practice that the operators have all signed up to, um, pre-consultation letters were sent out to the local ward councillors and also to the local MP and the um, local planning authority as well. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, so that no, you, you, the company did not engage the residents. I just, that's all, that's the question. You didn't engage them. No, it's an existing no. site that's there at the moment. And Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Councillor Dean, please. Oh yes, thank you, uh, Miss Han. Um, the, uh, the there's been a suggestion that this this um, mast could be accommodated in a nearby or on a nearby mill. Have you considered that either inside the top story or on the roof of a nearby mill, which apparently the residents believe would be a better spot as far as they were concerned? I'm not sure which mill they're talking about. Is it the Hope's Mill that's further to the northeast? I don't know. Possibly that information could be uh, found by Councillor Warren. I suppose. OK, let's let's go back to a more general question. What other buildings in the area have you considered and, and, and have you got an evidence trail of coming down to this particular one, which apparently is visually obtrusive to the residents? In the area, you've got industrial units, but the design of them is mostly um, what I would call crinkly sort of corrugated iron where the telecommunication structure doesn't um you, it doesn't attach that you can't attach it to corrugated iron it would just fall away and so it wouldn't be able to be built in that way and um also the um there's a lot of pitched roofs there so the design of the pitched roof would also cause clipping of the the roof so the antenna signal would just bounce out all over the place and wouldn't actually be directed into the target coverage area they wouldn't do the the job that it's designed to do okay perhaps i'm, I'm not making myself clear but how did you when you came to this particular site were there any large mill buildings nearby that you considered your company considered no but, um, no mill in the immediate area. If you're talking about the old Hovis mill, that's a listed building, and the conservation officer was concerned that this site potentially would um, have an impact on the setting of that mill. However, a heritage statement was support, was submitted with the application documents that found that there was the, no impact on the significance of that mill. To put it on the mill, if you're talking about the old Hovis mill, that's listed and I'm sure that the conservation officer would be more concerned about having a site on that Grade 2 listed building there and the impact it's have on that heritage asset. Uh, all right, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Braithwaite, please. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Ham. Uh, you mentioned gaps in coverage. Uh, have you explored the viability of mast sharing rather than building a, a new one? Um, this is an existing telecommunication site that Vodafone is on there at the moment. So they've got an established network. They can't just go anywhere. They have to be in very close proximity to where that existing site is. And if they don't go in that, in that very small area, then it detrimentally affects the coverage to that local area and then if, therefore it won't provide the necessary coverage and my understanding is there isn't any other site in the area that's close enough to provide the replica co coverage that is required in this cell area for Vodafone. 
So you, you can't share with another company. I mean, have you actually investigated whether there is a, a suitable mast? There isn't one in the search area now for them to go and use. OK, because it, it does say on the supplementary information uh, with the application that you hadn't investigated mass sharing. Uh, I just wanted confirmation that, that that was the case. You can only um, share the mass if it actually um, will do the coverage that it needs to do. If it's too far away, the antennas don't go that far and therefore it wouldn't provide the replica coverage to the area that it serves. So you would still need a new installation anyway. OK, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Mannion, please. <coughs> thank you, Chair. I'm a little bit concerned when conversation in a previous question was relating to a mill, and you automatically assume we're talking about the Hovis mill, which indeed is a very iconic listed building. But actually, when Councillor Warren was speaking, he expressly referred to Brook Street Mill, which is very, very close to the site. And as far as I'm aware, it's not subject to any uh, building specific protection. So um, why uh, did you approach the owners of that of those premises uh, with regard to the possibility of fixing the mass to there? And as a supplementary, I'm a member of a local rugby club and we have a, a mast on at, at our ground, which unless it's pointed out to you, most people, nine out of 10 people don't spot because mm. it looks very like a pine tree. Now, again, um, having heard, listened to what the proposed design is, um, have you considered any works whatsoever to actually hide or to uh, disguise what the actual purpose of the structure is? Similar to what the um, the mass, which was in the green belt, to be fair, at, at Matlesfield Rugby Club, and looks very much like a 15 metre pine tree, Christmas tree. Thank you. As the frequencies get higher with te new technologies that come into the uh, uh, are, you, are you still there? Sorry, I've lost you. Yes, yes uh, we no, still, Sorry. Um, as the frequencies get higher with the new technologies that come through, so the latest 4G technology, for example, from, that has now been uh, into the four, the, the uh, signal attenuation is a lot um, greater. So basically the antennas get blocked a lot easier through clutter from trees, through the glass reinforced plastic of the um, the design of the, the the tree that you're talking about. So the latest technologies are bigger and heavier and so wouldn't be able to be supported by shielding of the antennas because the antennas wouldn't work properly. And so the signal wouldn't get through. So as the, as that, as the frequencies get higher, then the shielding of the antennas you can't shield the antennas as easily because then the signal gets uh, doesn't work as, as well, doesn't so it doesn't travel as far, so it won't reach your target coverage area. And what about the Brook Street mm -hmm. Mill rather than the Holvis Mill, which you alluded to? Um, I don't know where that mill is that you're talking about on on Brook Street. It's, it's actually adjoining the site. If uh, looking at page fifty nine on today's agenda. Um, it's actually, I'd say, within about 25 to 50 metres of the site, of your proposed site. It's on the corner of Brook Street and Turnock Street. It's actually called Brook Street Mill on the Terrier map. That's in today's agenda. <coughs> to to Thornycroft, Thornycroft Street, did you say? Or Turnock Street, is it? Um, it's on the corner of Turnock Street and Brook Street, and it's actually labelled Brook Street Mill. I think that's what Councillor Warren was referring to when he uh, was speaking earlier in the meeting on this item. So I'd ask, have you approached the owner of that of those premises? I don't believe we have, because as I say, this is an existing telecommunications established site. So first of all, we go to that existing site which is where the site provider um is allowing us to go so that's where it is at the moment i, I still can't see this mill if it's the one that's on i mean i think i can i can I assure you 
I can assure you I'm familiar with the area. It, it, it is an old mill. It's four or five stories high on the corner. It's in um, and it's uh, it's in multi um, business use at the moment. See, I think it might be the design of the if it's what if it's the building that I'm talking about. The design has got a lot of windows in it at the moment, and you wouldn't be able to attach the uh, the antennas to the design of the, the building because there'd be nothing to attach it to because the windows are in the way. OK, can we move on to the next question, please? Councillor Holland. <clears throat> oh, yes, thanks, Chair, and um, very warm welcome, uh, Miss Han. I've just got a quick question. Um, I'm looking on the map, it looks quite densely populated, that area. Um, so I was just wondering, um, if you've had, um, obviously, there's, you said that there's um, not a very good connection in the area. Just wondering if um, you've had feedback from residents st stipulating this and stating this. Obviously, you, your investigations create that. My concern at the moment is, is that obviously with children schooling from home, and I know it may hopefully, we all hope it's short lived, but um, children are struggling to get connection. And this does factor in on this occasion to this uh, to this debate. Thank you. Um, we did include, I don't know whether or not it's in the supporting pack or not, but um, during the lifetime of this application, we've submitted um, the voice drop calls information for Vodafone since October, and the dropped calls has gone up a lot since that time, since the installation was um, switched off and um, was removed from site. So it has had an impact on the area. and. Um, we provided that evidence in the application documents. Thank you very much, because that's very important at this moment in time, obviously, that we do consider that as well. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and I think all um, committee members need to think about that while we're debating this issue, simply because it's not just about the aesthetics here. We've got to think of all, all things and connection is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you also very much, Mrs. Hahn. Uh, don't see any further questions, so if you could please now turn off your camera and microphone and we'll move on. Um, so, uh, Mr. Wakefield, any issues that were addressed during the public speaking there that you would like to pick up on or address? Uh, there's probably one point that I might be able to help with, um, just in terms of reference to Brook Street Mill. Um, just for members information it's it's a locally listed building Brook Street Mill it's not nationally listed but it is what on our local list of important historical buildings so I think from a heritage point of view there would be concerns um, about sighting a foam mast on on such a bill on a, on a building like that with such a designation um, but I, I think again I mean in summary just to sort of summarize what Miss Han was was saying the I think the difficulty that they have is obviously the existing mast um, secures a certain coverage um, in this particular location. And as, as I sort of touched on within the introduction, a lot of the buildings or, or, or some of the buildings in the immediate location to the west, particularly are in commercial use with residential um, on the outskirts to, to the north, to the south and to the east. And then the further east you go, then you're moving towards the canal conservation area. So there are quite a few constraints in terms of having available buildings that are suitable to locate these masts upon. Um, the commercial buildings that do exist in and around Goodall Street, well, one being the Brook Street Mill is a locally listed building, but also I think as Miss Han alluded to, they have these pitch roof structures, which makes, you know, installation of masts difficult um, and I don't think they're any higher than the building that, that, that um, we're currently looking at as well so the visibility may still be there in the same way albeit not immediately uh, to neighbouring residents but from wider public vantage points it, it may still be there um, but I think that's the, the there's just been a general difficulty or there, there has been a general difficulty in securing an alter or finding an alternative site where um, that coverage can still be obtained um, in the absence of the existing mass, which has, has been removed, as she said, uh, some months ago with the with the drop in coverage, with the uh, resulting drop in coverage as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much it. But yeah, um, the main point was just about Brook Street Mill being locally listed. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you, Mr. Wakefield. So now I'll go back to members. Are there any questions that you would like to raise uh, and put to our planning officer? Yes, Councillor Findlow, please. It's amazing, Chairman, how flexible this local listing is. When I pleaded it in cases in my ward, it didn't stop the demolition, let alone anything else of buildings. So it seems to be a highly flexible policy. Thank you. Councillor Manning, please. Yes, I think I need to follow up, Councillor Finlow. The, 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 mill in, the mill in question is liberally covered with the modern low quality vinyl advertising signage. So uh, whilst it may be locally listed as a structure, it is not the most vis visually attractive building. And um, so I would like to see, uh, I'd, like, I'd like the officer to see on the, on the balance, the planning balance for the admission of a short stub mast somewhere high up on the um, building, how that would be more of a, a detraction of its immunity value than some of the very large vinyl signs that are stuck on the side of it at the moment. Councillor Dean, please. A uh, question for uh, Mr. Wakefield. Uh, the uh, when you get this, this application, there's obviously a great deal of uh, supporting information with it, which is not in our pack. Was part of that supporting information an evidence trail of local alternative sites within? And I appreciate it would be a small radius within the very small radius, which would be suitable. Uh, to fit into the Vodafone network. Is there that evidence of, uh, available that, that you personally or your, your people have seen and are satisfied that uh, all alternatives that might be suitable have been checked out? Thank you. Are there any further questions before I go back to Mr Wakefield, please? Uh, Councillor Finlow. Remind me, Chairman, on page 52, did we go on a site visit last August? Um, we went on a site visit for... I thought that wasn't allowed. I, I, don't think it, I don't think it was this particular site. We certainly went to Bank Street nearby. Yes. I thought we weren't allowed to go on site visits last... Yeah, that, that may be referring to um, an officer site visit or uh, uh, it may be the wrong year, but I'll see clarity on that. Thanks, Councillor Findlow. We certainly didn't carry out a member site visit on the 18th of August last year. I, I think you're right, Chairman, and that's the point I'm making. OK, are there any further questions? Uh, otherwise, I'd like to close the list and go back to the officer. OK, thank you. Mr Wakefield, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in answer to Councillor Dean's query, uh, in short, no, there isn't a, a list of, of, of alternative sites that were considered and then discounted for, for whatever reason. I think, but I, th I think that's all wrapped up in, in, in pretty much what Ms. Han just explained, the fact that it's an existing site, an, an existing telecommunications site, and that's, that's the preference. In terms of order of preference for where these masks should be located, it's uh, looking at existing sites, using ex other sites belonging to other operators, uh, installations on existing high buildings or structures, um, then using small scale equipment or erecting a ground base site. So there's kind of five options and upgrading an existing base site is, is the, the first op option in that order of preference. And this is what this application seeks to do. It is an established telecommunications site. So and for the reasons we've said, there are difficulties in securing that coverage uh, or that the operators had difficulty um, locating other sites, even to discount them because they, they just don't exist um, within this particular area to provide, provide the coverage that they require. And they did have prior to the mass being removed uh, by the con construct and uh, those building the existing development on the site. So, um, in answer to your question, no, there isn't a list, but there are reasons for that. Um, in terms of Councillor Finlay's query, what was that? Oh, page 52, reference to a site. What is it? It's very bottom of page 52. Ah, right. Sorry, yeah, that was, that's with regard to the, uh, that with the case officer carrying out the site visit, not, not the committee. Sorry. 
Sorry for any confusion on that. Um, I think, was that it, Chairman? I think it was, just the two points. Um, there was a point raised by Councillor Mannion as well. Oh, about, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand what he means. I think, again, with Brook Street Mill, it's got that pitch roof design, so it makes in, in, installing a mast on it or a, a tower on it quite tricky. Um, as, as Miss Han pointed out, it's that left little flat roof design that would be required to be able to accommodate it. Um, but I also, I don't know, I, 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 um, I, I, I still maintain that Brook Street Mill has some architectural value and is, is quite an attractive building, notwithstanding the various signs and um, attachments that there are, are on it at the moment. Um, but as I say, I was just flagging up the fact that it is a local listed building, so members might, may well raise concerns the fact that it is a local listed building or one, would not want a mast on it. Um, but other than that, no, nothing further to add, Chairman. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Mr Wakefield. I would like to uh, now move to the debate. Uh, Councillor Findlow, you, your hand is raised. Is that a, a pressing question or are you volunteering to open the debate for us? Uh, I'll just ask the question and not volunteer with your kind permission. On page 55, it says uh, in Terralia that development will normally be permitted unless, and then one of the reasons is it would be visually obtrusive, obtrusive and result in a significant impact upon visual amenity in a rural or urban, here urban area. Well, I, I think this case may fit that description. It's not conclusive, but it is evidential, isn't it? Um, I, I would uh, say that that's a matter for us to discuss and debate, and to be perfectly honest. Uh, but uh, Councillor Mannion, please. I, I was disappointed in the lack of local knowledge of the agent, which is understandable because they probably have a, a caseload of several sites similar to this across the region. And therefore, I'm going to make a proposal uh, and leave it there. I think we should defer this item today because I want to see evidence that because it is a built up increasingly residential area, as Councillor Rowan pointed out. Therefore, I think the applicant needs to evidence, justify, prove they've gone the extra mile to try and, to try and find a less obtrusive location. Yes, I appreciate what Mr. Wakefield said, it's a replacement, and therefore it doesn't exactly fit into what is explained in the very last paragraph, paragraph C on page 54. Uh, whereas if it was a new if it was a new mast, they'd have to work so that they'd gone through a range of options and alternative sites. I want to see, I think we need to see, and I think we owe it to the local residents that. Uh, if this is the only viable site, and I don't mean viable on, on just on cost terms, because yes, I have seen them on, on roofs that have a pitched uh, elevation to them. I have seen these masks, and, I, and as no doubt we all do. Uh, but it obviously is a little bit more technically uh, sophisticated and therefore expensive for them. But when the the agent admitted they'd not actually approached the owners of this building, so they've not even surveyed it, uh, and she wasn't actually aware of its presence. She was she thought we were referring to the Holwis Mill. Uh, I do think we should adjourn this to give the um, applicant the opportunity to explore this properly, and I think we deserve that to the local residents. And if it comes back that it, it, it isn't a technically viable option, well, we'll take it from there. But I think at the moment we haven't the I'm not satisfied the applicant has exhausted all the alternative options to placing it right next to existing and proposed residential properties. Thank you, Chair. So uh, I, I'm happy to propose that. And again, if uh, I'll be intrigued to see if the uh, if the committee uh, wish to pick that up. Thank you, Councillor Money and Councillor Puddicum, I believe you were next. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Masks of this nature are always of a can be somewhat controversial. I won't say always, but but can be somewhat controversial. So I think can can some council Mannion's right that we do need to make sure uh, it's we give sufficient cons uh, weight to this um, to this item. 
Um, it is in a mixed area, but that area is now becoming more residential and is due to become more r residential, as Mr. Mr. Wakeford explained, with um, other planning, planning, planning permissions in place. Um, I actually learned quite a lot from uh, the agent today um, about the fact that they need to have certain specifications that, that they work within um, in getting replacement masks that would um, improve communications as we move towards 4G technology. And uh, the agent, um, Mr. Wakefield, pointed out that Chapter 10 of the NPPF, uh, Paragraph 112, states that our policies have to support expansion of electronic communications networks. Uh, but we, we do need to make sure that it is fully explored. So I would second Councillor Mannion's uh, motion for deferral. Thank you, Councillor Puddicum. Could I now go to Councillor Harewood, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's good that we've listened to all this, but um, we have not identified what the amenities lost will be. This is a place that had a mass for years. Um, they're saying it was poorly attended, but it was there and it's being replaced for better. And okay. Councillor Warren did okay. not say okay. it is not of use or better use. Come down. Come down. I think what's missing here is that the company has not uh, um, said or that they that they conversed with the, the neighbors. I think that's the main thing that's missing here. This lack of communication that was left to officials in the sense of consultation and whatever. And we have a poor thing on consultation. This I think that is the main thing missing. They have not engaged the residents. I don't know that a, 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 a case has been made that a new location will be made, that a better location will be made, that the services will not be improved. I think what is happening here, there's no, there has been no dialogue, no conversation. And I think uh, I would have liked to for us to look at that better um, before I even think of, of uh, agreeing with a deferral, because a deferral might be a deferral, for everybody's sake, I, uh, in my own mind, I don't think a deferral will be a different location, but then maybe uh, I should not say that. You don't know what a deferral will be, but that is the main thing. You have not engaged the community and you have not really said you will do better. Uh, and I rest it there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harewood. Um, there is a proposal clearly on the table for deferral. Um, I will go to, to, to Councillors Dean and Holland as the hands are already raised, but I would advise caution if the motion for deferral is passed, this will uh, come back to a future committee date. So I advise caution in terms of comments that uh, members may be seeking to make. Councillor Dean, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, 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 all I was going to say was that um, uh, I, I think uh, this particular application, although it's not effectively or it's not regard, regard, regarded by the applicant as a new um, uh, a, a new signal tower, it, it, it's almost the same as a new one because the old one was different in three ways. It was a monopole. Uh, it did an awful lot less in terms of what it was able to do. Uh, so there's a lot more kit on this one. It's two meters taller. It's a different design and it's on a building which hasn't been built yet or has just been completed. So to say it's a replacement is a bit of a stretch. So I, 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 I think deferral until all the proper searches have been done and perhaps conversations with the local people have taken place would be a good idea. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Councillor Holden, please. 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think deferral is a good idea, but I am very conscious of timescales here. Obviously, uh, with you reminding us that we shouldn't really say anything because in case it comes back. Um, but I think time is of the essence um, as well. But because of what all the um, councillors have mentioned uh, on this committee about um, lack of um, conversations with local residents, then that is perhaps the right thing to do. But I'd also mindful to say that we really, um, you know, the um, Mr Wakefield has approved this uh, and uh, the, the, the generally the, the the recommendation is for approval uh, and yet another thing that we are going against so we have to be conscious of that and let's hope it doesn't incur any fees thank you thank you councillor holland so i'll now just go back to our planning officer mr wakefield um just to check that we're clear and uncomfortable with the reasons being stated for deferral um, and that uh, he believes they are sustainable thank you chairman um I suppose I could just do a bit of clarity as to understand whether it was just, is it just to look at um, Brook Street Mill or is it just sites in general in, in terms of other alternative sites that are available in the area and reasons why they're discounted? My understanding was it was the latter of the two. Right. That's what I thought, yeah. Indeed. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Otherwise, yeah, nothing, nothing to add. Thank you. OK, um, Mrs Baxter, please. Uh, through you, Chairman, are we including consultation with local residents to take place as well? With the developer, so the applicant, sorry. Proposer. I'm happy. I'm happy for that to be included. Um, second, uh, Councillor Puddicombe, happy with that? Uh, yes, I'm happy, Chair. Thank you very much. So I'll now move to the vote. In that case, it's been proposed by Councillor Manny and seconded by Councillor Puddicombe for deferral. Um, seeking to address the two things we've just raised. Um, so please indicate, as I call your name, for, against or not voting on the proposal of deferral. Councillor Braithwaite, please. For. Councillor Dean. For. Councillor Findlow. For. Councillor Harewood. Mm. Councillor Harewood. Not voting, not voting. Councillor Holland. Also not voting. Councillor McFarlane. Four. Councillor Mannion. Four. Councillor Murphy. I don't think he's no. in the room. Uh, Councillor Nicholas. I'm against. Thank you. Councillor Puddicombe. Four. Councillor Smetham. Against. And myself, Councillor Craig Brown, also against. Six, three. One, two, three gains, two Thank you. So that is clearly carried for deferral. Uh, six votes for, uh, three votes against, and two deferrals. Uh, sorry, two, two not voting. So thank you, members. Uh, we'll now move on to our last application um, of the day. Uh, this is item nine, application reference two zero stroke. 2966M. This is a reserved matters application for the approval of appearance, landscaping and scale following the approval of outline application 19-3201M for the construction of a detached bungalow at 79 Shrigley Road South Quinton for a Mr John Powers. And could I now ask our planning officer Paul Wakefield to present this application. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there is just a, a small matter to update. Um, since the agenda was published, we do we have received uh, a revised landscape plan which uh, addresses the points that are listed on page 66 of the report. Um, just with one slight proviso, though, it, it, it's, it's necessary for the hedge plants that are shown on the, on the plan that I'll show you during the presentation. Uh, to be planted a minimum of 60 centimetres back from the sight lines. So that's actually the back edge of the hedge symbol, which is shown on the drawing. Um, so the front face of the hedge uh, doesn't encroach within, into the visibility display. Um, so there's adequate room for planting and for it to grow and still stay outside of the visibility display. Um, and so it's proposed that we just add a condition just to or add to the landscaping condition those particular details in terms of the, the positioning of the, the hedge planting along the frontage uh, relative to the visibility space. 
Um, that being said, I'll just share my screen. <clears throat> Councillor Clark, could I just ask you to turn your camera off while we're doing the presentation, please? Thank you. Uh, so this, um, fortunately, another one we, we did do a, a visit for, um, 79 Shrigley Road South, uh, when we considered the outline application um, some months ago. Uh, existing, there's an existing dwelling on the site, single storey building number 79. Um, and uh, the proposal sits between 79 and 77 as an infill development, which uh, the principle of which was accepted when we granted the outline permission. Uh, Shrigley Road South, as you can see, sits opposite the Middlewood Way. Um, and it is primarily made up of uh, a row of um, bungalows, uh, single storey dwellings. Mr. Yes. Mr. Wakefield, sorry to, to interrupt you. Are we, are we supposed to be able to see the presentation at this point? Oh, yeah. Can you not see it? No. <laughs> ah, right. Just bear with me. Let's try again. Am I not sharing my screen? Um, all right. Why is that not working then? Try again. That's, that's working. You see it now? Great. OK. Yeah. Let me just. Hopefully, if I change it to slideshow view, we'll still see it. Um, can you see the location plan? That's good. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so Shrigload South, as we've said, is um, opposite the Middlewood Way. It comprises a row of, of uh, single story properties, bungalows. Number 79 is a bungalow which um, it's within the application site and the dwelling will sit between 79 and 77, the principle of which was agreed at the outline stage. Um, so Shrigley Road, um, just to yeah, just to show it in its in its context, it is located within the green belt, um, as we can see with the open open fields opposite uh, beyond the Middlewood Way. Uh, application site is just towards the bottom of the page. Uh, this is number 79 and then this is the gap that's filled in with number 77 being the immediate adjoining neighbour and then as we can see that row of, of, of bungalows uh, stretching towards the, the north. So this um, is a photograph from Shrigley Road uh, showing the existing dwelling at number 79 uh, with the, the gap if you like on the left hand side and then Again, just a sort of a clear view of the gap itself. Hopefully it will um, be familiar to members given that we did visit the site, as I say, some months ago. And then the neighbouring property at 77, which is a, a re excuse me, a relatively recently constructed uh, dormer bungalow. And then again, just showing the context of other properties um, along Shrigley Road South as well. So the this was the approved layout plan at the outline stage. So the existing access is, is being retained and utilised with the plot split into two. Uh, the southern part being retained for 79 and then the new dwelling being located between that and 77. Uh, parking spaces at the front provided and turning area uh, for each property. <coughs> Excuse me. And then so the proposed landscape layout um, as we touched on before, visibility display is secured at the point of access. Um, there was a conifer hedge that I think is, is now shown to be removed and replaced by a, a more native uh, hawthorn hedge. Um, uh, areas of hard standing to the front and surrounding the properties, but then the remainder of the uh, property uh, laid out to lawn. Um, which is pretty much as is with the existing situation on the site anyway. Then the proposed elevations uh, and, and the plans, as we can see, it's a single storey structure. Uh, so this right hand side is the um, is the front elevation here. Uh, a section of timber cladding 
uh, which ties into the, uh, the property at number 77 and then there's um, the rest the remainder of it is, is rendered <coughs> excuse me with um, which, again which ties in with other properties along the road uh, south as we saw in the photographs um, but yeah it's it's uh, self-explanatory really it's it is a single story structure um, and for the reasons set out in the report chairman it is recommended for approval thank you very much Thank you very much, Mr. Wakefield. We have uh, one public speaker registered for this item. So could I now um, invite Town Councillor uh, Clark to turn back on his camera and microphone and prepare to uh, address the committee. And uh, Councillor Clark, uh, you have five minutes. Please begin whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, a few points. Uh, first of all, uh, the officer's summary um, on the front page of the report described this as a relatively sustainable location. Uh, I, I can't see how it can possibly be so described when it's over two miles from the nearest shop, the nearest school, the nearest doctor's surgery, the library and so on. It's quite clear whoever lives here will be making extensive use of the car. Uh, there's no way that, I just wonder what, a, what they would have to do to get it described as unsustainable, put it on top of a mountain probably. Um, the second point, uh, the Town Council's main concerns, however, rest upon the comparison of this application with the outline consent 193201M. Now, if you look at the decision notice for the previous, the outline application, clause three, which you can see there, hopefully, uh, lists 10 plans which it's supposed to conform to. The problem is, when you look at the website on your Cheshire East planning website for 193201M, only three of them are on there. Seven of the plans are not shown on the website. So including anything with the elevations on. The only plans on the website show the block plans, like the map. Uh, they don't show um, they don't show the elevations. So I don't see how we can compare what was given permission with outline consent with what's been proposed now. It could be taller. Uh, we just can't be sure it's the same. The third concern is clause eight of application of Planning consent 193201 requires a surface water drainage scheme to be approved by Cheshire East. That's not been submitted. There's nothing about that at all on, in, uh, on either of the planning uh, application sites. And the latest officer's report doesn't mention flooding at all. It refers to policy SE 13 with the policy to do with flooding, but there's no evidence of compliance whatsoever. So, uh, and if you look at the map at the bottom of the uh, officer's report, You'll see that Point and Brook runs just to the south of this site, only a few, a few yards to the south. So it means any runoff water will go straight into Point and Brook, you know, down the brook, and if there's plenty of rain, it'll flood Point and Village. Now, I'm afraid I can't also place any reliance in statements about oh, it'll be dealt with, you know, by uh, compliance and things, because we've got an estate of, as Mr. Wakefield knows, we've an estate of 150 houses being built in Poynton. The developers have completely ignored, have failed to, to provide the water drainage scheme required in their outline consent and they're busy building it now. Uh, we've had to get on to your councillor Tony Fox and she's trying to get your uh, compliance people to deal with it but developers obviously don't care much about those sorts of things. Uh, finally item point, my fourth point is for application 22966 there's a contamination report on the website but the town council and all our members computers won't open it they say it's too large so what it says i've no idea uh, but we can't review it nor can members of the public the fifth point is there should be a report from the coal authority this is a former coal mining area there's uh you know the, the former coal mines dotted all around that part of point and and potch wrigley uh, but there's no report from the coal authority so we don't know if they're built you know I'm not saying it will be the case, but there could be a mine shaft uh, directly under where they want to build it. Uh, and finally, traffic. Um, there's things have changed hugely since the previous uh, since the outline application was uh, was approved, and there are vastly more cars parked in that area now. The car park is always full and overflowing with people parked on the road. People because now people aren't supposed to go more than five miles. Lots of people are going to walk on Middlewood Way, which is good, but too many of them are driving there and the traffic congestion around there is absolutely horrendous. 
So I hope that will soon be over as we all do, but it's another point to bear in mind. So I think those are my main concerns, probably centering upon the apparent failure to comply with the outline planning consent. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Could I ask, are there any questions from members, please? I'm not seeing, oh yes, I've got Councillor Harewood, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, um, sir. You, you mentioned that there will be travelling difficulties and then in the same conversation you talked about how many cars were there. So uh, wouldn't, wouldn't that take that out, that there'll be no travelling difficulties? And my, uh, if I can do a second question is, a lot of um, libraries and doctors are done uh, n without cars, without getting there. There are new arrangements. Are you aware of those? Thank you. Well, the bus services in Poynton are limited to say the least. Uh, we do have one, um, as, as your chairman knows well, uh, but uh, they are limited and I mean, there are a lot of cars parked around there because the Middle Way is a very popular resource. It is, there are vastly more now there are people taking exercise locally. Uh, I've had complaints from residents alleging that many of these people actually don't come from Point and they've come from Stockport. I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but certainly there are a lot more cars there than there were before, without doubt. Uh, building an extra house there will put another car, other cars on the road because I think I think the likelihood is, in the vast majority of cases, whoever buys that house will use the car to go to the shops, go to the library, if they've got children, take to schools, go to the doctor and so on. I think that's inevitable. It's possible they'll walk it a couple of miles into Pointer, but I don't think it's likely. Thank you. Any further questions, members? No. OK, so thank you very much, Mr. Sorry, Councillor Clark. Uh, please could you now turn off your camera and microphone again, but do feel free to remain in the meeting. And I will now just go back to our planning officer, uh, Mr. Wakefield. There are quite a few issues raised there during the, uh, the public speaking. Is there anything you'd like to come back on? Uh, I suspect uh, there will be questions. Um. Thank you, Chairman. No, I think I mean the only thing I'd, I'd say is that there is an outline permission, and and obviously that forms part of the planning permission. The reserve mark matters forms the other part, uh, and and the development has to be carried out in accordance with both. I mean, in terms of drainage details, there's no requirement for the drainage information to come in with the reserve matters application. It just has to be done prior to commencement of development. So there's been no no fault on the part of the applicant by any means. Um, the, the drainage matters were considered at the outline stage. The, the advice from our flood risk team was that the condition would suffice. The condition is there, still remains, and falls to be complied with. So um, that would be the case uh, moving forward. Uh, same with, with any any sort of contamination uh, details, they would have to be complied with as well. The um, Outline permission granted permission for out, uh, access and layouts, which the I, I showed the, the the most relevant plan within the presentation, um, and the reserve matters does comply with that the access and the layout as approved. So, um, yeah, the information we've got is in accordance with the outline, and there's there's no no conflict with it. I suppose is probably the best way to put it. Um, but the, the applicant just has to comply with the requirements of the outline as they would the requirements of any reserve matters permission that may be granted today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wakefield. It probably would be reasonable for us to, uh, uh, if we were minded to approve, add a drainage condition, however. Um, I don't think that's included currently on page 68. Uh, are there any other questions, members, back to our planning officer? Uh, Councillor Mannion, please. <coughs> Yeah, Councillor Clark made reference to uh, the the neighbourhood has been subject historically to underground mining. Uh, I'd, I'd ask Mr Wakefield to clarify, I understand Unicontact, I think it's still called the Coal Authority, it might have changed its name since I 
I, I, I retired. But if if a development is within so many meters of a known working or mine shaft, is that the case? I'm just looking for some reassurance. Uh, thanks. We'll come on to that one, uh, Councillor Manny and Councillor Dean. Next, please. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, the um, I think it is called still called the Coal Authority, Councillor Mannion. And my question was the same as Councillor Mannion's to find out where we are with the uh, the search for uh, any previous mining underneath. Thanks, Councillor Dean. Any further questions before I go back to our planning officer? Okay. So in that case, Mr. Wakefield, please could you uh, could you respond to that? question. I'm just trying to find uh, the, the principle of the development obviously was assessed at the outline stage and, and it would have been at that stage where the, the, the coal mining issues would have been addressed or should have been addressed. Um, I'm trying to find reference to it as we speak. Just bear with me one moment. Um, just in terms of that, just while I'm looking for that chairman. Just in terms of the drainage condition, as, as I said, there is a drainage condition already on the outline permission, which which is still relevant and still um, needs to be complied with prior to the commencement of the development. So it wouldn't be necessary to add another one onto um, onto the reserve matters as well. Just bear with me one moment. Sorry. I'll keep you one moment. I think the difficulty, as I say, I'm just trying to open up the previous report, but as I said before, the principle has already been accepted, which is where, and it's at that stage where we would have considered any um, coal mining issues at the time. And I can't, I just can't remember off the top of my head whether or not we did it or not. Um, I seem to think, I thought we did, but I, I could be getting, because we, we've dealt with quite a few sites in and around higher point and so um i may i may be getting confused with another one but just bear with me i've got the report open here now um, i can see councillor holland seeking to ask a question so shall i go to council okay. holland yes please, please okay. do yeah, yeah so councillor holland please um, sorry it's not a question it's more of a statement just relating to this i suppose is um my recollection um is that uh this, whenever these come up at a higher point, and it's often referred to either by councillors from um, the point in council uh, that, um, you know, we have to consider mining um, pa or past mining things that have, have occurred in the area. So I would imagine there was something. I can't recall whether that was correct, obviously, for this particular uh, application, but I, I do recall from the past that we've often considered this. Thank you. Yeah, there are only certain areas where a coal mining risk assessment is required. Um, and I think, I mean, if, it, if it's something that members needed um, comfort on, albeit notwithstanding my view that I think we've kind of missed the boat anyway on that, um, it is perhaps something that we could, um, if members were happy with all other aspects of the scheme, then maybe we could delegate it back and I could co confirm back through yourself, Chairman, if, if, if necessary, just what the clarify what the position is on the coal mining point um if that would be of assistance but i can't I'm, I, I'm struggling to find any reference to it at the moment i must admit okay i would certainly be happy with uh, with that if me members were minded to approve with a with a referral back uh, to clarify that position on mining uh councillor manning please and then i'd like to move to the debate please i was just about to suggest that chair that we could put that in uh, we could put a hook in for that it's somewhere if we managed to approve. Thank you. OK, thank you. So, um, sorry, Councillor Manning, you've put your hand back up again. Is that because you want to oh, stop? Geez. <laughs> OK, uh, Councillor Smethen then, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd be happier to know for sure that this isn't in a, a zone of land mining um, issues. But I'm just checking with the papers here and it says um, that we are looking at matters of appearance, 
landscaping and scale. And um, as far as I can see, there's no problem with that, any of that um, here in this particular application. I just thought I'd throw that into the pot. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Snatham. Yes, I, I think that's right. Um, the principle of, uh, of development was effectively made when we approved the outline application. So it is just uh, those three aspects that we're being asked to consider today, the appearance, the landscaping and the scale. So any other contributors? And if there are no contributors, would anybody like to make a proposal? Uh, I'd like to make a proposal, Chair. Yes, go ahead, please, Councillor. Because uh, we approved subject to that, that must be decided by yourself and the officer, because um, there are other houses there, um, and I cannot uh, agree that the library and the GP has that hold that kind of track record of cars in order to access them. So I would like to propose that we approve the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harewood. That's recorded. Councillor Mannion, please. I'd like to second that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Mannion. Does anybody else wish to speak before I go back to uh, back to the officer? Uh, Councillor Hale, I think your hand's still up. I'm assuming it's from before. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll go back uh, just briefly to uh, to Paul Wakefield. <coughs> Anything else we need to be aware of? Um, it, it seems fairly straightforward. It's been proposed and seconded for approval, uh, with a requirement to uh, to refer back on the issue of uh, historic mining position. Uh, in consultation with myself. So yeah. really no, there isn't anything else. But as we've said, it is uh, we have effectively missed the boat if, if there is an issue there, um, because we are only looking at the um, appearance, landscaping and scale of the proposal. But um, I'll be happy to report that once I've had that time just to clarify if that's OK. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll now take the vote. It's been proposed by Councillor Harewood, seconded by Councillor Mannion for approval. Uh, please indicate for, against or not voting on the proposal of approval. Councillor Braithwaite, please. For. Thank you. Councillor Dean. For. Councillor Findlow. For. Councillor Harewood. For. Councillor Holland. For. Councillor McFarlane. Four. Councillor Mannion. Four. I don't think Councillor Murphy has joined us. So Councillor Nicholas. Four. Councillor Puddicombe. Four. Councillor Smetham. Four. And both Councillor Brown also four. So that is carried unanimously um, and approved. So thank you very much members for that. And also thank you for your uh, time and consideration today. That completes the agenda um, and is the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Cheerio. Cheerio, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.